So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So I think we're right on the hour and, and we can uh, begin this, this session. So welcome everyone again to the online training workshop on advancing government innovation and leveraging frontier technologies for disaster risk reduction and building resilience. This is our sixth and final session with you. Um, it has been a, a wonderful exchange of sharing of experience and learning, and we hope that uh, this last session will continue. Um, actually, in last week's section, session, it was highlighted that uh, partnerships bring both opportunities, but also many challenges. And so in this session, we would really like to focus on uh, the experiences in innovative uh, partnership building. Uh, utilizing technologies for disaster risk reduction, but uh, especially for engaging in risk-informed um, development and engagement of all uh, stakeholders. So we have, um, we will be joined by panelists. You see them uh, listed on the screen. And I will first open with um, an introduction to this session. So while that's coming up on the screen, uh, I am Sarah Wade Aficella with the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. And again, it has been our pleasure to be with you during these six weeks. So I think my slides are coming up. So this session is going to uh, draw on the many experiences uh, of innovative partnership building. But before that, I would really like to uh, draw your attention to some of the key opportunities, case studies, and guidance that is available to you in the toolkit that we have shared. So next slide, please. So this session, um, is ideally going to help you understand and make the case for multi-stakeholder partnerships as essential for risk-informed governance mechanisms. We hope that you're going to get ideas on how strengthened, diverse, and innovative partnerships and the use of technology can strengthen risk-informed governance and practical action in your countries. We hope that you will get to know more about various multi-stakeholder mechanisms and uh, including networks and innovative uh, collaboration platforms and how to join. And finally, as I mentioned, I really want to tie this to the toolkit on risk-informed governance and innovative technologies for disaster risk reduction and resilience. Next slide, please. So um, this slide and the following slides are uh, coming from the toolkit module three and I want to start with this slide that focuses on stakeholders and partnership. We've already talked very much about the, the riddle, really critical nature of engaging everyone and consulting everyone and including everyone in processes for planning, but also implementation uh, to really reduce risk and increase resilience. And through that, we know that capacity development, a strong enabling environment, and especially the funding and resource mobilization are critical. So these are some of the partnerships uh, that we will hear about today, uh, but which you can also further explore in the toolkit. Next slide, please. So from toolkit module 3.1, um, the capacity development process is explored. And I'm not going to go into all of these details, but what I want to draw to your attention is that at every one of these steps, identifying and engaging with stakeholders, doing capacity needs assessment, defining interventions. Um, all of these actually require consultation and participation of the groups with whom you want to benefit. Ultimately for step four, right, to build partnerships, lasting partnerships that we hope can lead to sustainable actions for implementation. And in the sixth area, monitoring and evaluation, which again is not just about ticking boxes and seeing that you've done things or produced things, but actually um, that monitoring and evaluation engages your partners, uh, that you're constantly engaged in asking, you know, what is the benefit and how, um, how can that 
become a sustainable relationship. Next slide, please. So if we look a little bit more at uh, the recommendations on step one for identifying and engaging stakeholders, we're reminded indeed this is an everybody's business business. We need national government uh, from parliamentarians and line ministries to the local and subnational actors, but also private sector, um, non-governmental and civil society organizations, including the community-based organizations, academia, individuals and households, regional organizations, and UN and other international organizations and financing institutions. Next slide, please. So when building partnerships, the toolkit elaborates in this step of the capacity development process, some of the key questions that can be asked. What are the drivers and motives actually for partnering? They can be different to different actors, so it's important to clarify the purpose of the partnership. Do the partners have written agreement? Um, is it needed? Do you have the enabling environment to support it? What are the benefits and risks? Um, and how will these uh, provisions for building, maintaining, reviewing, and evaluating be made to ensure ongoing collaboration? Next slide, please. In step four, um, partnership building, we can also consider some of the uh, key stakeholders and key partners. So what relationships might you have uh, with already existing or that could be built upon? Um, who, are, who are the partners that are likely to be engaged and what are their relative capabilities? What can they bring? Um, there are a number of guiding questions here and I think in the toolkit you'll find uh, several examples. Next slide, please. So also in the toolkit, um, you know, partnership again is cross-cutting, but you'll find many case studies in particular in this module three uh, that really highlight and demonstrate how partnerships have been innovative to support some of the pressing issues uh, around disaster risk reduction. So in this case, for example, the problem is the demand of sustainable development efforts to increase or are constantly increasing in complexity. And there's a need for stakeholder access to data so in this example, the solution is around collaborating to make data solutions widely available. Next slide, please. In the next case, you see um, how increasing engagement and access to citizen science opportunities are done through the development of a national framework to guide that citizen support and science engagement. In the next slide, please, um, we also highlight the necessity to ensure you have access to resources. So potential pathways to those resources can actually come through innovative partnership, public-private partnership, through development assistance, through South-South, North-South, and other cooperation mechanisms. Next slide, please. So that uh, in the monitoring and evaluation stage, as previously mentioned, um, you can ensure partners also progress towards their own intended goals and you can redefine the modalities for partnership as needed. Next slide, please. So some of the issues that have been raised uh, through the discussions and through our, our previous uh, sessions um, pointed to a number of issues, including the, the digital divide. So there's a lot of work to go here and I just wanted to highlight one uh, case that the solution is around improving the training for media who are tasked with communicating warning messages, public training to better understand and respond to prediction data, for example. So, you know, we may not think of, of partners um, like the media sometimes or even communities, but it's very important. Um, next slide, please. Also in uh, the Asia Pacific region, the Disaster Risk Reduction and Science and Technology Group in Asia actually developed an action Okay, I think you can hear me again. So um, in this case, the science and technology uh, group actually developed a multi-stakeholder regional policy focused strategy so that they could connect their efforts and uh, ensuring the policy landscape. Can we go to the next slide, please? 
And in this uh, case, we also see the effect of science, technology, innovation, policy perception. And through the improved coordination with the community, um, enabling the development and adoption of uh, a specific policy, this one coming from Indonesia House of Representatives um, on the National System and Science Technology Bill. So these cases and others are available in the um, toolkit. And if we just go to the next slide, please. Included in the toolkit are uh, the 10 monitoring and, monitoring and evaluation processes each with case studies. Next, please. And the emphasis on how to allow stakeholders to investigate uh, and participate in the uh, planning process of um, using technologies to reduce disaster risk and enhance resilience. So I just briefly want to move through the next slides. Um, highlighting again that there are themselves many opportunities, including through the monitoring and evaluation through Sendai and SDG implementation. Um, these global frameworks already give global targets and corresponding indicators, including guidance on how to engage, in particular SDG 17 uh, that calls for innovative partnerships. Next slide, please. And the Sendai framework itself, in its first priority, calls for an understanding of disaster risk and uh, at national and local levels and clarifies with regard to technology some of the key uh, requirements real-time access to data the use of space and in situ information gis ict measurable tools among others next slide please it also highlights the means of implementation that requires the use and expansion of existing thematic cooperation platforms and for innovative research and to ensure access to all. So this is the task for all of you and I think we'll hear from our panelists uh, how they have done this through uh, partnership. Next slide please. The Sendai framework paragraph 36b also focuses on the specific stakeholder groups including academia, science, uh, and research entities. And I just want to leave you in the next slide um, with an outline of some of the many uh, stakeholder engagement mechanisms that the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction provides. A rise for private sector, um, the stakeholder engagement mechanism, including voluntary commitments and contributions that you are welcome to join through our global assessment report and global risk um, advisory uh, group through the science and technology advisory groups and the International Science Council, working with parliamentarians, financial sector, and all the many groups, including youth. So I thank you for your attention and we'll move over to uh, introduce our panelists before opening the floor to them. And we are joined by Mr. Abdul Kalam Azad, who is the Special Envoy of Climate Vulnerable Forum Presidency and Distinguished Fellow of the GCA from Bangladesh. He's bringing a diverse and in-depth experience of over 34 years in the civil service uh, in the field of development administration, judicial service, hum uh, human resources, public health and power sector, and recently in the climate change adaptation and climate vulnerability issue space. He has previously served as the uh, Principal Secretary and Principal Coordinator of Sustainable Development Goals in Bangladesh for five years and negotiated with UN on the graduation of Bangladesh for, as an LDC. We are also joined by Ranit Chatterjee, who is a PhD in Environment Management from Kyoto University, trained as an architect. He did his Master's in Disaster Management from Tata University in Mumbai. His current focus is on disaster management while spanning architecture, heritage, governance, private sector, and ecosystem services. He's worked with numerous agencies, including the private sector, and he's the co-founder of Resilience Innovation Knowledge Academy, RICA, uh, a social entrepreneur startup. And he's going to share with us some of his experience working locally. He's also um, a recognized youth scientist, and uh, we really, we really welcome him. We are also joined by Mr. Demetrio Inocenti, who joined the Green Climate Fund in 2014 
um, and previously has worked with the World Meteorological Organization and the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Um, he is currently the GCF manager of the Simplified Approval Process, the Project Preparation Facility, and on enhancing direct access to pilot programs of particular interest, I think, to our SIDS and LDCs. And has Michelle joined us? Yes, wonderful. Good morning to you, Michelle. And we are also joined by Ms. Michelle Chivunga, Global Policy House based in UK. She's the founder and CEO, and it is an investment and digital economy and blockchain solution business, exploring emerging technologies in the context of emerging markets, trade, enterprise, and sustainable development. She's often been referred to as a young thought leader and investor in the blockchain and finance space. She's been recognized as a global fellow for FinTech for Good, working with the UN and others. And she works as a senior advisor to several governments, including the government of Bermuda, African Union, British Blockchain and Global Institutions. So I really want to welcome all of our panelists. And I'm first um, just going to, to do a quick round and ask you, uh, just for an opening remark on um, what you see in light of the, of the complexity and the interconnectedness of today's risks really brought to light by COVID-19, what do you see as the greatest partnership opportunity to enhance risk-informed governance or actions on the ground? Mr. Azad? Thank you very much. Thank you for introducing me with very bright words. Uh, partnership starts um, if um, we tell with the, the government. Uh, in our country, we tell governorship, like entrepreneurship. And uh, we tell the magic word TCV, time, cost, and visit. So that reducing time, reducing cost, and reducing visit, building a great partnership between the service provider and service seeker. Ban Ki-moon in the last week on 16th of uh, this month, while opening the uh, African Office of Global Center on Adaptation, he told, in 1970, um, uh, the cyclone Bola took life of 500,000 people. The cyclone of same magnitude in this year took only 112 lives. Only single life is very precious, but the magic is partnership uh, amongst the stakeholders. In the uh, main session, I will try to elaborate this story. Thank you. Thank you very much. So same question to you, Rani Chatterjee. What, what do you see as the greatest partnership opportunity? Thank you, Sara, and very good afternoon to everyone from Kyoto. Uh, this is unprecedented times, and unprecedented uh, precedented times calls for unprecedented uh, solidarity in actions. And I see the major gap that we are having right now are four, possibly uh, issues with data, issues with technology, issues with knowledge, and issues with information. So if I put it in short, which is easy to remember, uh, we are facing problem of decade which is data, knowledge, information, and technology. And uh, going by the whole of the society approach, I guess it's not just one stakeholder or a group of stakeholders who is important, but I guess everyone has their own uh, expertise and importance in taking care of this situation. And uh, mainly I would focus here on the role uh, or possibly the handholding that needs to be done uh, between government, academia, private sector, and focusing on uh, especially the young professionals, we, people whom we are looking forward for managing, say, what we are projecting for 2050 or 2030. So we are looking at those people who are now possibly youth or young professionals would be the leader, future leaders. So uh, I would try to elaborate on this uh, in my presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Michelle, same question, given today's yes. risks. Thank you so much. What are the greatest opportunities? 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Good morning to everybody. Good afternoon. Sorry, it's morning for me here. Um, but uh, yes, I think one of the most exciting, actually, opportunities in terms of partnerships, I think, is actually, you know, between governments uh, and then the emerging uh, digital economy and the players within the emerging digital economy. Especially when you're thinking about, you know, the opportunities that we have when leveraging, uh, you know, data and some of the new emergent technologies, you know, things like blockchain, which again, I'll cover a little bit in, in my presentation. But I think that, you know, today now is really the opportunity to actually tap on what's within the fourth industrial revolution. And I think governments, private sector, academia have a major, major role to play. But I think, you know, up to now, there's been a little bit of a divide uh, between what's happening within the fintech ecosystem and what government, for example, is doing. And I think the fintech ecosystem, which is growing quite rapidly at the moment and really, really fast, I think that partnership between the, you know, the, the fintech and the digital economy, uh, as, as well as the government and the private sector players, can have massive, massive opportunities. And I'll highlight a little bit more in my discussion, but very exciting times, I think. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes, with challenges come opportunities. And you, Demetrio, what do you see as the greatest opportunities? Thanks, Sarah, and uh, uh, I'm lucky that uh, I can speak last because uh, uh, I don't have too much to add to what uh, Habul Rani Tamish already said. Uh, let's say maybe I can put the perspective of, uh, of the organization I work with, which is a, a multilateral organization that finance projects, projects that deals with the disaster reduction, with enhancing the resilience uh, of countries, of communities. So, uh, just to say that uh, if you if you look at partnership as a Venn diagram, surely we have uh, we must have the countries and the local governments, the communities that tell us uh, uh, what are the needs, and we have uh, the experts uh, from uh, from the institutions, from the agencies, from uh, uh, RICA, from the private sector that give us the technology. And, and there are the donors, so the investors, uh, if you like uh, more private sector type of terminology, that's to the lifeblood, the finance, that uh, we need to deliver this technology where they are needed. And so um, at the end, uh, for us as a, as a financial institution, what it matters is to really to investment that are risk informed. Uh, because otherwise we all risk the loser if uh, we don't build up uh, uh, what we are all doing, same objective and uh, on the basis of a risk informed investment that if you like is a consequence of uh, risk informed governance. I stop here and maybe a little bit, uh, elaborate a little bit more on the enhanced direct access and its relevance for seeds and LD seeds in my presentation shortly. Over to you. Wonderful. So thank you all for your opening remarks. And I think what we're hearing is a mix of right, needs and matching the service and what is the right kind of partnership. And there are, there are many opportunities. So um, I'll then move uh, to Mr. Azad, Mr. Mohammed Abul Kalam Azad, and ask you, sir, please to, to share with us your practical guidance and inspiration uh, from developing partnerships for disaster risk reduction and resilience building through multi-stakeholder uh, partnerships and mechanisms uh, in Bangladesh. Over to you. Thank you very much. I will try to take the participants to a wide picture of Bangladesh, which is a uh, disaster from country. What disaster we don't have, almost all. Flood, cyclone, drought, uh, so many. Uh, in the next slide, uh, this is for the um, idea of having uh, how, uh, just one example, how did we do during, uh, we are doing during COVID. This is taking service to the doorstep of the client. Uh, a um, corona patient, he or she can access to his or her regular necessity, medicine and supplies. The uh, partners, uh, the consumers, obviously youth entrepreneur, shopkeeper, and financial uh, techni technology, obviously the uh, administration. 
So this, uh, I, I will show in the next slide that the 12,000 pharmacy and also 100,000 shopkeepers uh, will, uh, uh, were connected in this. You see in a picture in the next slide that how uh, a consumer, he calls youth entrepreneur all over the country up to the grassroots level, we could mobilize so that whenever a person rings, uh, this youth entrepreneur gets the information along with the shopkeeper. And uh, these youth and the shopkeepers, their entity are verified by the local administration. And they used to monitor the activities of the young people digitally and the shopkeepers. So the order goes through the shopkeeper, youth entrepreneur, uh, and then carrier. Sometime it happens that the youth entrepreneur, he becomes himself the carrier and uh, the commodity goes to the consumer. So as I was telling at my uh, opening statement, TCV, that is the time, cost and visit. In our country, we used to tell what is innovation in public service? If it is tested by TCV, time is reduced, cost reduced, and also visit for getting the services reduced. Then in Bangladesh, we call it a uh, innovation in public service. So more wide in the next slide, we see that uh, what are the major disasters area uh, and uh, disaster risk reduction we need to address. We all know whatever may be the disaster, if it is flood, it is cyclone, it is um, river erosion, uh, it is landslide, uh, affected area are health, agriculture, education, obviously infrastructure. So all these issues uh, we try to cover with the great partnership in our country and also the COVID, uh, which I showed in my first two slides. And I will take the opportunity to tell a few words again on Corona in the next slides. Next, please. Here, we identified that uh, the technology is in three area. That is the COVID, health and other non-COVID issues. And finally, flood especially uh, we want to mention that what uh, technological issues we addressed here. Uh, I will not take time in this slide because uh, all these are explained in the next slides. Next. You see the innovation during COVID, uh, especially with the health sector. The whole health sector we brought under the digital uh, technology and uh, in one platform with one dashboard. Uh, having the, uh, what are the health regulations? If some person from administration wants to know, he or she can have the easy access. Daily press briefing were there, including all the issues of the COVID. Uh, obviously, the awareness materials were available in our website. Uh, you will find, um, uh, and also the, COVID-19 results tracker, uh, emergency service. Uh, on the right hand side, you see, uh, these are the telephone numbers uh, uh, on top right of each box for uh, getting information on these COVID health issues. Next slide. So data analysis we did, uh, maybe at this stage, uh, wide range of data. I don't want to use the word big data, but a huge quantity of data uh, we uh, collected, we analyzed, and we used it for the decision making uh, in different manner, uh, uh, verifying uh, data analysis, and uh, finally, um, multi-stakeholder communication, through multi-stakeholder communication, and doing through a website, corona.gov.bd. Next slide. Uh, telemedicine support, as always, uh, it is done in some other country also. Here, we have the uh, unified platform where 27 companies, those who provide uh, telemedicine service, we communicated, we brought them under one umbrella, 800 doctors, 24-7 service, including the emergency health services. Next. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, a uh, normally non-COVID uh, intervention, but also we know that uh, during COVID health issues were 
neglected uh, for so many reasons. Here also the uh, lactating mother and also uh, pregnant mother, uh, they get service by using the digital platform 109 and then expert doctor, uh, he or she gets the uh, prescription and also necessary uh, support, necessary informations on the right hand side you see. And at the right bottom, you see the uh, referral system that is the highest um, expert uh, organization we call Bangabundu uh, uh, University for the medicine. So starting from a doctor to the highest institution, we could link with uh, and engage all, multi, all stakeholders in this process of uh, telehealth care center. Next, please. This is for education during COVID and during non-COVID. We have uh, on the uh, right hand bottom, uh, in Bangla it is written, uh, that is the open platform for uh, education. This, is, this relates to health, this relates to uh, normal education. During the COVID we know the students, they cannot go to school. On the right hand side you see uh, one teacher, she is taking classes in secondary, technical and madrasa institutions also. And a wide range of uh, uh, open platform for the COVID issues, how to handle a patient, how to uh, collect the samples for the uh, COVID swap and all these, these can be uh, uh, provide, provided through these platforms. Next. Uh, this is one of the unique uh, area of work that is the uh, open crowd funding in Bangladesh for the first time. During COVID, we innovated that how people can donate uh, their uh, efforts, donate their money for the betterment of the uh, local people uh, uh, sitting in any parts of the globe. Uh, he or she can support the country people in Bangladesh. Next. So, Disaster control and management system. Uh, in uh, here, you will see at least five area: uh, food support or employment, uh, houses support, dwelling support, citizens advisory, and also the blood donors information. All in the digital platform. So huge number of volunteers about to see, uh, which is about six point eight million volunteers, and uh, in all other area also. So huge number of uh, stakeholders, uh, different types are engaged in this platform. Next, please. Here is a pictorial view. In Bangladesh, we have a standard operating procedure for uh, handling a disaster, different type of disaster. It may be cyclone, earthquake, or flood, or river erosion. Uh, on the upper side, you see the entities the uh, government uh, offi offices, different offices, they used to uh, report to the uh, Dis National Disaster Response Coordination Center. And from this center, obviously, through SMS, phone, email, or digital, through digital center, uh, all over the country, we have about 13,000 digital centers uh, for disseminating the information. And down towards, it goes to the uh, people uh, for whom we collect this information. Next slide. As I was telling that Bangladesh is a disaster prone country, uh, almost all the disaster we need to face. Uh, we have three river basin uh, on the, from the uh, western side, that is the Ganges basin. From north side is the Brahmaputra basin. And from uh, eastern side, we have the uh, Meghna basin. These three basin, uh, about 1.72 million square kilometer and uh, about 12 times of the area of Bangladesh. We need to carry the seals of Himalayan about uh, 1 billion ton per year. Uh, so uh, all the rivers, all the uh, uh, canals are choked with the uh, sands and all these we need to deal with every year. Next slide. Next. Uh, this is a pictorial view that how uh, flood occurs just in 25th of uh, June 2020, 
and 25th of July. You see what changes. So these devices helps us for giving early warning. Next slide. So with this message, in the next slide, you will see that how flood affected uh, Bangladesh. So uh, it's a common feature. And in this slide, you see, this is early warning system that water level will rise by 19 centimeters in next three days. So all concerned get alert with this. Next slide. Uh, during, uh, for disaster management, we had uh, digital innovations in different area. Uh, there is the toll free telephone. Also, we used to use it for the local administration and uh, distributing the food support and also early warning system. Next slide. Education. In Bangladesh, we had a uh, remarkable footstep in education sector. You see, in every year, we used to distribute 320 million books. 320 to 360 million books per year, free, all these students. Along with this, these are the steps that the, in the uh, national, in all the books of the schools and colleges, uh, we have the disaster management issues, public universities, training institutes, and also the uh, academia. Next slide. Next. So these are the major area uh, where uh, the development partners can put their efforts uh, in all these uh, uh, area where uh, starting from the air pollution to infrastructure. Next slide. How did we develop the partnership? Uh, so these are the partnership with UN organizations uh, for having the disaster management, health issues, disaster risk reduction, and also health system recovery. In the next slide, you will find uh, that um, how we take the support from the international organizations. Uh, also, here, the technological development is one of the prime issue, starting from the Google uh, and also the Harvard University. Next slide. How we take the support from the private sector also. So even bodies, non-government organizations, uh, private bodies, uh, support for uh, combating the climate. Next slide. Next slide. So here is the policy, how do we do? The foundation is the data governance. And we have the basic three principles, accountability, effectiveness, and inclusiveness, standing on four pillars, policy regulation, national data strategy, data ecosystem, and data technologies. And these are the elements. We see about uh, 12, 13 elements, and all done under the partnership with stakeholders, which covers the SDG 17. Next slide. As I was telling that Bangladesh uh, uh, turning from uh, disaster to resilient country. We have a plan from 2021 to 2100. Yes, you are hearing the correct thing. We prepared our Delta plan and uh, turning Bangladesh from digital Bangladesh in 2021 to uh, innovative Bangladesh by 2041. I will conclude by telling uh, one thing that all these efforts are done under PIP. P, first P is the political will. I is the innovative steps, that is the digital platform. And the last P is the partnership. So P is the magic word for the success story. And last word, Pope Francis told, these are the disaster risk reduction, but what Pope Francis said, that if you uh, uh, commit any mistake with nature, nature will not spare you. And he, he told that, God always forgives. People forgive sometimes, but nature never forgives. If we consume much, if we produce much, all these steps all together will not able to cope, will not uh, make us uh, a, uh, bringing us a better condition for our future generation. So we need to 
have um, uh, looking into the Mahatma that uh, the globe produces uh, enough for needs, but not enough for the grids. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Azad. And I think uh, this PIP message and, and the long term, the very long term strategy of Bangladesh are, are very uh, inspiring. So without further ado, uh, we will continue on our panel. And I would like to invite Mr. Rani Chatterjee, please, uh, to share with us uh, your guidance and inspiration uh, on developing partnerships for risk reduction and resilience. Um, particularly on engaging youth and young professionals uh, for citizen science. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, I'll uh, start with where I left. So uh, in this COVID times, uh, I guess everyone is grappling to understand what exactly is happening, not only uh, common people like me, but also at a very senior level within the government. Uh, you would see that Everyone is trying, testing, but without any proper evidence to see how they should actually take the next step. So uh, when we started thinking that what would be, if I started thinking as an individual that where do I see, uh, you know, that what kind of information do I need to see, uh, have if I need to make a decision? And that's what was the motivation to uh, develop this tool. I, I guess uh, Mr. Azad had given a very uh, bigger picture. My presentation would be very focused on the specific tool. And uh, so uh, the idea was that when we looked at uh, different kind of tools which were available uh, in the very early phase of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, most of the tools were focusing on health parameters like uh, do you have comorbidities are you of this age group but is it the only factor which actually defines uh, why this covid is spreading so that was the major uh, kind of question that we were trying to understand uh, the next slide please So we felt that there is a need to look beyond only the health parameters as a, as a kind of factor which is spreading the uh, COVID-19. And there were different kind of, uh, I'm talking about somewhere in March when we were looking at uh, say Italy, China, and possibly US were starting to have uh, the spread. And India at that point of time was uh, kind of doing pretty well. It had only uh, 50 cases, if I remember correctly, or possibly lower than that. And But what uh, we felt is possibly most of the actions that are being taken is reactive. Like say, today in one city, you find five cases. So then there is a lockdown uh, that is imposed or some area which is having some, uh, you know, high suddenly uh, increase in cases, possibly they would uh, try to ban, uh, restrict uh, movement within that area. But is, that is kind of a reactive approach. But is there a way to have a proactive approach where we can see that, foresee the risk, like where, which all areas can have uh, possibly uh, risk of spread in future? So that was one uh, idea. The second, of course, I said health parameters. The third is can we link it up to the decision making process say not only where to ban where to lock down but also what kind of uh, mitigation measures should be taken up and that doesn't only rely on the government but also on the ngos cbos as well as ourselves and here we consider that and i still believe that if we have to stop the covid-19 spread we all have to act uh, in unification, but at an individual level. If we say that, okay, something the government will impose, we'll follow it, possibly it might not uh, solve the issue that we are facing now. And then fourth is, of course, we uh, heard in the early phases, WHO saying that uh, it's not only a pandemic, but more of an infodemic. And how do you communicate effectively to an order, wider audience? 
what do you communicate and the importance of generating awareness. So these were few factors that we thought would be important for developing a tool uh, for the COVID-19. The next slide, please. So with that, we've made these five uh, design considerations. First, a tool needs to be, we had been seeing many tools, including uh, different governments coming up with different kind of, you know, using the latest uh, platforms like AI, MI, and all those things. And they were trying, uh, most of these tools actually were saying that we are using AI on all. But I think when we are talking about the mass or the people in general, I guess that user interface is very important where it has to be so simple that any person, and I thought that it has to be so simple that when I give it to my dad and I say, my uh, dad, you please use it. He should be able to use it. He shouldn't have a problem. That was our idea while developing this tool. The second is it should be scientific. It should not be something like we are trying to test, but based on scientific evidences. And that's why we uh, kind of positioned our tool based on the uh, kind of st uh, scientific studies that emerged from China, Italy, and also other places. Uh, the third is the data privacy. And this is something which we uh, considered based on the uh, issues of infringement of personal uh, data space. Like say, when you are using an app, possibly it also asks you to send your one-time password, which uh, registers your mobile. And a lot of people feel uncomfortable because of various reasons. So that was another consideration. Fourth, is this uh, kind of a tool should be adaptable? It should ch be easily uh, changeable based on the changing situation, but more generic. And fifth, it, it should be scalable. It should not be just focused on one area and we cannot scale it up. So these were the five design considerations for the tool. The next slide, please. So we came up with this tool. It's called COVID-19 Risk Assessment Tool and you all can uh, access it. It's uh, the web page is given, uh, the link to the web page is here. We didn't make it a uh, app. We intentionally made it into a web page so that it's easier to access. Anyone can access it. And it doesn't just rely on your mobile, but it can be through your laptop, it can be through the tablet or any other means. And the second thing is um, this tool, we kind of try to make it very simple uh, in its approach so that it can open in very basic phones as well. It doesn't need a very high-end smartphone to access it. So this was another consideration. The next slide, please. So while designing this tool, we took four indicators or four parameters, I would say. One is health, exposure, behavior, and social policy. Because we, from different uh, publications that we read, we found that these are the four uh, fact, uh, parameters which are actually having a very big impact on the spread. And within health, say age, gender, smoking, and comorbidity, I'm sure, uh, many of you are now very much aware about the health indi uh, indicators. But on exposure, where do you stay? Like say, are you staying in an informal settlement where possibly in a closed space, 10 people are staying? If one person gets a co uh, the infection, it's very easy to spread within the other people who are sharing the space. Or are you staying in a detached house? So it would vary to a certain extent. Your movement how often are you moving? And that point of time when we made this tool, there was no lockdown imposed. And also many countries did not impose lockdown, including Japan, like because by constitution, they cannot impose uh, lockdown. So movement was always there. And third is what kind of occupation are you into? And based on that, your risk would vary. Then the perception, we try to get on the, like, you know, bank on the perception, because I guess the perception changed a lot and people now understand what is disaster uh, management, what is basically these hazards, are, uh, how it does those hazards play into your, our own our daily life. So now the risk perception is really high. The behavioral traits, like say, how many times do we touch our nose, knowingly or unknowingly? 
i think many of us do it without knowing uh, knowing even or possibly do we wear mask when do we wear mask those are certain things that we try to look into and then the trust in government uh, decisions trust in what has been uh, shared the adherence to different social policies so these are some of those uh, factors that have been taken into consideration and based on this what we did is we kind of made 15 questions because it should not be a like you know 20 page thing which people someone if you give it to someone he keeps on feeling and by the end of it he is like oh my god what did i do why should i why did i actually start filling it up so it should not be a burden on the person who is taking it second is uh, we employed weight in mean method so that to uh, devise the risk and based on the weighted mean you actually can have the risk levels which shows that okay you might be at higher risk you might be at lower risk and you can based on it you can have very specific advisories uh, that what you should do what kind of things you should follow so we divided the advisory into one which is risk specific the other is general advisory something which everyone should do and the fifth is this tool also became a database because i guess there is no database or baseline on based on which we can make a decision so this would give us a database of say uh, possibly at a ward level where we can decide that okay this ward is doing this ward might be having lower risk than the next ward and if we see that within a ward the risk is lower it might be lower because people have better behavioral traits or people are having a better adherence to the uh, social policy or whether they are having issues with the health parameters or there is a issue with the exposure so based on it there can be corrective measures taken up for each of these uh, parameters the next one please and finally based on the outcome of this tool uh, we also published a paper because if this tool has to be continued for any future such uh, incidences it has to uh, leave a precedence it was also featured by international science council as well as gfdr newsletter as a innovative tool which can be used and easily uh, can be used uh, adapted for any country or region and the third uh, is we recently have customized this tool as a quick risk estimation tool for the micro small medium uh, size enterprises keeping the same logic but changing the whole question uh, setup and i guess you can always access it through the link thank you thank you rani thank you for bringing this down to the really local and practical level and i think the design considerations right not forgetting the users people are actually at the center is is so critical so we'll now move uh, to our next panelist. I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Michelle Chibunga to please share her thoughts on practical guidance and inspiration for developing uh, resilient partnerships from the uh, private sector perspective, including engagement of uh, entrepreneurs and, and social startups. Over to you, Michelle, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Really, really great to, to present and thank you so much for the previous speakers. I think they've really touched on a lot of uh, areas which I will pick on a little bit. Um, it's a pleasure. I think, you know, technology is very much uh, playing a major role. I think even post-COVID has been one of the major solutions actually in, in, in driving forward, um, you know, stability around economies. So I think that's something that we're starting to see quite strongly. And then it's playing a big, big role in terms of some of the recovery and resilience plans. Uh, and I'll just dig, the, you know, a, a little bit into detail around that. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, certainly. I think I think one of you know what I've tried to to map out here is actually where we have started to see the usage of emerging technologies, particularly when I'm talking about emerging technologies. I'm very much referring to the usage of things like robotics, uh, you know, uh, virtual reality, uh, blockchain, AI, uh, big data. You know, some of these words, you know, tend to be buzzwords that I think we hear quite often. I cannot really link them up to what's happening on, on the ground on a day-to-day -day basis. And here I'm just trying to exemplify a little bit 
uh, in terms of how these technologies have really played a critical role. I think pre-COVID, uh, we certainly had uh, uh, challenges, I think, to kind of make the case for some of the technologies like blockchain and what role that can play. But, uh, you know, bringing this into the, the marketplace, I mean, what we've seen with uh, COVID is actually the destabilization and the lack of trust uh, within global value chains and, uh, uh, you know, and, and then blockchain, I think, plays a very critical role in terms of enabling that connectivity and providing that trust element. So, for example, you know, one of the things that we are trying to promote is actually that people centric uh, uh, private public partnerships. And what I mean by that is actually really looking very, very deeply as you've heard from some other presenters into how do you actually start to understand you know, individual economies and, and what partnerships within those individual economies need to be forged. I think take, for example, when you're looking at uh, you know, emerging markets or in Africa, for example, where the demographics play a very, very critical role, uh, where you have a very hybrid of young people, young entrepreneurs, um, you know, again, these young entrepreneurs and the startup ecosystem in there is very struggling a little bit in terms of access to things like, you know, capital and resources for them to actually implement some of the solutions they have. So I've seen, you know, uh, young people who developed apps during COVID, uh, you know, trying to support communicating the messages around COVID uh, using these apps, but very much difficulty for them in terms of scaling that. And I think that's where partnerships come in, where you, we've seen actually, I think across Africa, where governments have actually stepped in and have been working with startups and fintechs for the first time and trying to bring these uh, solutions to scale. You know, in places like Rwanda and Kenya, you know, you've seen like drone usage and a whole range of uh, um, technologies that deliver medication and food and, and, and really sort of practical solutions that can help within those economies and to drive that um, uh, re responsive uh, kind of approach. And then the other really interesting thing, I think with the technology is things like AI and its analytics ability. Uh, is when you're looking at risk reduction, for example, you know, we've talked a bit about risk. I think when you're starting to leverage, you know, analytics and the usage of things like AI, you can start to utilize, you know, that AI to really start to read those big data sets that we talked about. So data is very much at the heart of this. And then how do you start to utilize that, those data sets and using technologies like AI to start to read those data sets so you can almost kind of predict what's going to happen. Uh, before it actually happens. So in terms of, you know, responding to that resilience and recovery in future, it's very, very important that we start to collect these data sets and start to understand what those data sets are telling us to actually mitigate against what happens in future. Um, and then that helps to build even more responsive governance structures, uh, you know, working with different governments and working with the startups, like I said earlier on. But at the heart of all this, as I said, you know, it's very much around people. You know, I think those partnerships that are formed uh, should have the basis of people, should have the basis of, you know, understanding entrepreneurship, you know, sort of intergovernment, uh, uh, startup entrepreneurship. And that focus around sort of the enabling and the connectivity as well as the communications, I think is very, very important in partnerships. Um, the interconnected solutions that I talked about between startups as well as, you know, large corporates as well and, and uh, governments, I think has actually helped to, to help mitigate against, you know, uh, really unintended consequences as a result of uh, COVID and other areas. I think, you know, in certain parts of the world, you could have been much, much worse had there not been those kind of partnership forged to try and address some of the challenges. And we're starting to see that quite strongly. Now, I've highlighted a couple of just, uh, you, you know, um, actual case examples. Uh, Bermuda, for example, you know, we, you know, right from the start when COVID kind of hit, Bermuda wasn't necessarily affected really, really badly to begin with, but they put in very, very quickly mitigation structures around, okay, how do we look at testing at airports? How do we look at reading any data sets that we have coming through, you know, and then working with the local startups that are then fintechs, because the Bermuda is really encouraging this uh, um, opportunity to, to encourage startups to come into Bermuda. Uh, and to actually play around and innovate with their solutions. And that has worked in favor for Bermuda as a result in, in, you know, during COVID, because they're really leveraging off the opportunities that are coming from the solutions that are being deployed by the startups and the fintechs, uh, in particular that are in, in those markets, be it around communications and using social media platforms to communicate to people about what's happening almost on a daily basis, uh, regular kind of messages coming from the president, as well reassuring economies, you know, that's okay, they've got a handle on, on this situation, I think is very, very important. Uh, I'll shift a little bit to Burundi and some of the things that we are doing as well at the Global Policy House around education. Now, education has been huge 
hugely impacted as a result of COVID. A lot of young people haven't had the education or the level of education that we want them to have. And at the moment we're developing, you know, not necessarily just apps, but actually different, you know, blended learning opportunities, uh, even in rural parts of like Burundi, where we're bringing education around things like these new technologies, AI, you know, uh, blockchain data, understanding the fundamentals behind this and starting at a very young age to educate and include even in remote areas where there's limited access. Back to the point that was raised around uh, the divide, you know, um, that is growing. And I think we need to close that digital divide as we move forward because uh, technology is certainly going to play a massive, massive role moving forward. And we believe that education in particular, I think needs to be really restructured and governments again can work in partnership uh, with fintechs and education um, uh, institutions to drive a new form of education. Uh, you know, some of it can be done through things like, you know, apps, some of it can be done through things like you know, even robotics. Um, you know, there are massive, massive opportunities in terms of to reevaluate education. Some countries are having to kind of close back up and down, you know, they're, they're introducing new measures around uh, lockdowns. I think, you know, that's another indicator that we need to look at a different way of educating, um, you know, and reaching the young people. I don't think young people should go for six, seven months without uh, you know, very clear structured, you know, online education if that's needed because we have to lock down. There are certainly technologies in place that can help with that. Next slide, please. And, and, and here I've touched up again a little bit around the solutions that can actually be utilized. Uh, when you're looking at even resource mobilization, again, you're talking about utilizing things like, you know, blockchain and uh, digital finance. So what we call blockchain-based finance, where you're starting to utilize the technology to enable you know quicker faster and more transparent disbursement of resources that again you know results into accountability on how these resources are being utilized so most countries have introduced stimulus packages around uh, COVID-19 but I think even if we go back today and say okay how are we tr tracking and tracing to see that you know those funds are actually being utilized to the, to the most effective way you know it's kind of very very difficult but I think if you start to implement uh, using blockchain-based uh, uh, digital financing platforms, for example, then you're able to start to look at the audit trail uh, of the usage of those, uh, those resources. And then when you're looking at things like microloans and credit loans, especially in communities where access to that cash or capital is very, very difficult at the moment, but we want people to have access to the resources. So how can we deploy these in a faster way? So the in integration of things like AI, blockchain and IoT devices, again, enables uh, for that to actually happen and to happen much, much faster. I've talked a bit about the uh, app utilization, uh, which has come into full force, I think, you know, uh, during the COVID uh, crisis. And, and, and part of that has also enabled governments uh, as well as private sectors to actually understand a little bit better about how they can operate with each other and how they can partner with each other, which has resulted in greater monitoring and control uh, as well, you know, and also has enabled that opportunity to look at things like actually these data, that we are collecting and getting into place. How are you taking and storing that data? How are you making sure that data is secure? Um, you know, how are you ensuring that, that people and consumers are protected in terms of their data usage is protected? And I think, you know, technologies like blockchain again, and then technologies like AI again can help with actually uh, supporting that. Uh, but the communication has to be there between the fintechs and the governments and private sector and financiers uh, in terms of enabling this to happen. Next slide, please. And one of the things we do certainly advocate for, you know, uh, the global policy is actually looking at it in a more holistic manner. Uh, so, you know, some of these technologies, you hear about them individually, you know, robotics, AI, blockchain, but in actual fact, you know, the real value add that, that comes is actually the amalgamation or the uh, combination of the range of technologies. So for example, you know, blockchain, it's transparency and distributed sort of ability combined with IoT connectivity through sensors and a range of other things can create a more holistic approach uh, to looking at the value system. So how do we go about ensuring that, you know, we can uh, have this open door to sustainable finance, uh, to enable more access? How do we encourage smart recycling across cities, provide smart disaster preparedness and, and, and relief solutions? How do we tap on the technologies to do that? But I think, you know, the, the, the opportunity to the emerging tech is actually provides more connectivity, you know, and allows for that engagement between partners and partnerships to actually happen in a more uh, efficient and more cost effective way. Uh, you know, when you're starting looking at healthcare, for example, I think we've seen massive, massive impact of technology in healthcare. 
you know, uh, telehealth and a whole range of other uh, opportunities that, for example, GPs have had in terms of communicating with patients through digital means. I think we can elevate that a little bit and make it a little bit even more secure in terms of, for example, medical records can be stored. And I'm sure some of the governments we've been working with certainly are looking into that, ensuring greater protection in terms of the data that's there on medical records, uh, data around, you know, um, uh, sort of medication as well, you know, vaccines that are coming into force. How can we ensure the quality of the vaccines? How can we ensure that we're able to disperse those vaccines quite efficiently and, uh, and, and fast enough that it reaches many, many populations? We can prepare for that now rather than when we do actually have the vaccine, then we start to worry about how do we distribute, uh, you know, who sort of gets the vaccines first. I think that's a very, very important element. That's where technology can come in very, very heavily in terms of making sure that we are, uh, you know, we're sharing that. Next slide, please. But that circular economy, I think, is where we want to head uh, and ensure that we're leveraging the technologies. Again, this is just highlighting a little bit in terms of the journey of how we are seeing the world shifting. I mean, even pre-COVID, we did talk a little bit around this, on how do the economies of tomorrow you know, look like? How can we encourage uh, the economies of tomorrow that are not necessarily just focused on technology. I think the easy bit, bit is actually technology. Uh, the difficult bit is getting partners, you know, working together, collaborating and understanding the value in that. Uh, you know, so you can develop infrastructure system and, and that platform economy. Uh, and then, you know, we are obviously encouraging the opportunity for that co-creation where partners, partners are working together uh, to co-create, uh, you know, to benefit from, from, the, um, from the opportunities. Bringing technology, I think the technology is very much an enabler. Technology is actually there to make life a little bit easier. And we have to be very careful as well with technology because, yes, we hear about the positive uh, contributions that technology can make, but we also have heard of the dangers of, for example, machine learning and artificial intelligence, where if it is not, uh, you know, structured properly or built properly, then you have some challenges around that and, and how machine learning is used. Uh, but certainly data, you know, I think data is very much at the heart of it. How do we start to really use the data that we have access to? How do we share the data? How do we ensure we have those data laws in place to ensure that we're sharing data and the right data and then the right data is being held by the right people as well when you're looking at sort of data protection. But we are moving towards a society that's a lot more personalized, you know, a lot more seamless. Citizens want to play a bigger role in terms of that decision-making process with governments. They want to have a bigger say. They want to have a more control around their own data. You know, they want to understand how their data is being utilized. We're moving and shifting away from an economy where, you know, I think the, the citizens have been more recipients. I think they want to play a more engaging role, I think, with governments and massive opportunity for partnerships there. Next slide, please. And, and just to kind of summarize, I think from our end at the Global Policy House, what we've done is we've been working at this quite uh, for quite some time, even pre-COVID, where we've looked at, uh, you know, sort of development frameworks and how you can utilize emerging technology to build up uh, development frameworks. And what we've done here is a sort of a, a recovery framework or a resilience recovery framework that we've put in place where we think is actually important. DTS, you know, really kind of refers to a digital transformation strategy. Now, a lot of governments and a lot of organizations are really looking critically around, do we need to look at a digital transformation strategy? Uh, do we need to have that conversation? You know, absolutely, yes. I think most everybody is now has been thrown into the digital transformation world. Uh, and it's a matter of how do you start to understand that world? How do you start to prepare, protect, and preserve? Uh, utilizing emerging technologies and driving forward uh, that digital revolution that we we do want, but we need to be very, very careful again around the digital transformation. So pre-post, you know, cyber uh, security systems, for example, you know, there's a lot of data that's being shared all over the place, left, right and center. But how are we ensuring that we're protecting? How are we ensuring that those cyber systems are resilient enough? Uh, how are we working in partnerships? Again, back to partnerships between governments and, and fintech players to ensure that security, you know. Have you got a data investment strategy in place? I think I've heard earlier on from the speaker earlier, who said we've invested in data uh, strategy. I think every nation should look into a data strategy and trying to understand actually how do we leverage the opportunities with data? How do we, you know, utilize things like blockchain, uh, you know, to maybe to store data to, uh, to ensure that data is, is, is stored securely. I mean, the different ways of, uh, of doing it. And then how can we leverage the technologies to help us read these data so they inform us 
before we go and start making policies and uh, you know regulatory frameworks in place how can we leverage those tools so that we make a bit more informed uh, uh, rules and we're looking long term we're thinking 20 30 years down the line how can we ensure that we're doing that again the personalization we're moving towards decentralized markets you know platform token economy again you know massive massive opportunities for partnerships there but to wrap it up i think you know we do need to look at those people centric uh, policies and need to ensure the partnerships are driven from that basis and finally my last slide is very much um, just the last one thank you and, and this is an example of partnership future partnerships you know what we've done for example looking at central bank digital currencies for example as a means to explore you know financial literacy financial inclusion uh, and opportunities across the world. So we're working in partnership with governments, uh, fintechs, uh, you know, so civil society and a range of other organizations to say, okay, can we explore something that can actually have massive impact across the board? Uh, and when you're looking at things like central bank digital currencies and what's happening in the shift in terms of future of money, that is where I think you're starting to see that the partnerships are really coming together and they're starting to explore and say, okay, what does this mean in terms of uh, opportunities and growth for different economies around the world. And we're certainly exploring that. Um, and finally, my last slide just gives you details of my uh, contacts and please feel free um, uh, to, to reach out. These are some of the partners we've worked with uh, and we continue to work with on a whole range of different solutions, uh, FinTech solutions. Uh, and the last slide has all my uh, contacts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. We come back to the importance of uh, people-centered design, but really uh, now looking at how, how can these uh, emerging and digital technologies in collaboration with government and people really uh, make a difference. And I think um, it's very interesting, the emphasis, one of your last points on the data investment strategy and policy. I think this is a common question we get. So we move from fintech uh, now to looking at opportunities for partnership and development financing, and particularly uh, for climate change and disaster risk reduction. Uh, so I hand the floor to our last speaker, Demetrio Inocente from the Green Climate Fund, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, well, we can go directly to the next slide. Please. My presentation will be uh, a little bit brief. Um, uh, yeah, we can probably click next so that uh, it appears uh, uh, everything N another couple of times. Uh, well, before I start, uh, since maybe the Green Climate Fund, I think it's quite popular in the climate change community. Everybody knows uh, what the Green Climate Fund is if you probably deal with uh, climate change. The Green Climate Fund is, in fact, uh, the largest multilateral fund that uh, is capitalized to provide uh, specific climate finance, which uh, of course should be additional to climate, uh, to, to development finance, actually should work hand in hand to provide that incrementality, that climate proof, disaster proof uh, in relation to climate related hazards, development gains. Um, the Green Climate Fund, GCF in short, started its operation not that long ago, uh, we started to finance projects back in 2015. So it's more, it's even less than five years that uh, we opened the business of financing projects. But, uh, we have already allocated more than six billion dollars in uh, in uh, in projects around the world in developed countries, and a substantial amount in Africa, LDCs and the seeds as well. Uh, the Green Climate Fund, what it finance? It finance projects that of course deals with the mitigation, meaning reducing or avoiding greenhouse gas emissions, renewable energy, energy efficiency, but also uh, almost uh, half, um, well, um, of its finance, uh, well, actually a little bit than half, uh, goes also on what we call adaptation, adaptation activity to climate change and disaster risk management, disaster risk reduction, um, are type of projects that uh, we usually finance. Uh, we have uh, basically in adaptation the goal of financing uh, four different uh, impact areas. One you see here is protecting livelihoods in uh, 
climate and disaster vulnerable zones. So we can finance actually even large projects. In, as a matter of fact, the, the, the GCF is a large uh, donor in terms of projects because our small projects are those that uh, stays in the round of 50 million US dollar. Uh, while uh, our medium are in the up to $150 million and the large are up to $150 million of funds. Uh, so we, we finance a large uh, uh, range of activities that can contribute to disaster risk reduction, green infrastructure, clean infrastructure. Uh, we finance, uh, of course, uh, projects that deals with uh, droughts and floods. And uh, the next slide, please, Linda. Um, uh, this one said uh, we finance projects that promote ecosystem-based solution or nature-based solution that can reduce risk. And uh, um, the point is that uh, uh, how we decide on what to finance or not. Uh, well, uh, we have a framework that is in call our investment framework that has six uh, criteria for investment. And uh, so we look at the potential of a project to bring uh, a paradigm shift, transformational results that are sustainable in the long term. We look, of course, at the impact on people, the impact uh, uh, that it can have uh, on uh, chain livelihoods. We look also at uh, its uh, uh, country ownership, it's that he adds the needs of the beneficiaries, that he uses our finance in an efficient and effective way. And also we look at uh, the potential to that our climate finance also have a contribution to sustainable development goals. And in this sense, uh, uh, reconnecting to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, now more than ever, we want to see investments, projects that uh, uh, national governments, international uh, organization, uh, non-governmental governmental organization, which bring projects as a credit entity to the GCF, uh, that they have in fact uh, a component that uh, either uh, um, creates job or the risk investment so that we can unlock private sector to chim in and uh, uh, produce that economic effect that we want to see in terms of green recovery in a moment in which uh, uh, many economies, development countries have been stranded by the pandemic due to COVID-19. And uh, uh, well, we can go to the next slide in which I will focus on the topic of today, the partnerships. Um, <clears throat> Partnerships are really at the center of how GCF provides finance. I try to put together a kind of simple uh, diagram in which uh, uh, well, you, you can see, I will start on the right side. Uh, we start when we decide what to finance, we put the center of the country. We, 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 we have this concept of country ownership. We work with the countries through a readiness program we have to build uh, country strategies in which basically the country with the national or local institutions are deciding what are their climate priorities. Of course, we should have alignment with the um, national determining contribution that the country has committed to the UN, uh, uh, UN COP. We, we should see alignment with the disaster risk action strategies such as the Senate framework. But the concept is that is countries national institutions are at the center of uh, uh, what GCF does. Um, then we have a series of uh, what we call accredited entities. These are organizations that can be youth system organization. They are all the multilateral development banks, uh, African development banks, as Asian development bank, World Bank, IFC. And most of all, they are what we call direct access entities, which are basically national institutions um, they normally are maybe line ministers like uh, um, the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Environment. We have also private sector. We have some major commercial bank like Deutsche Bank, Credit Agricole, or uh, uh, private equity funds uh, that are all credited to bring the project to the GCF. And uh, they should do this uh, in uh, coordination and uh, agreement with the country institutions. 
and uh, uh, what uh, what we want to see, as I said, especially projects that deal with adaptation, is that uh, they are risk informed, that they are based on solid climate and disaster risk assessment, so that uh, we can identify uh, the solutions, the technology, what is feasible at the specific uh, local context, and. Uh, uh, see which of these technologies. We, we saw the presentation before uh, <clears throat> from Michelle, for example, using blockchain, uh, using uh, uh, what we can uh, uh, have to do as uh, uh, cutting the edge technology to reduce disaster risk. Well, this is something that the GCF really would like to see when an investment is proposed to us, that uh, this technology are innovative, but also that are into uh, a country contest that justify them. And this is how we provide our climate finance back to the identity that then is our intermediate if you want to pass the climate finance country level. Um, next slide. And here I just say something about the three streams of work that in fact I'm responsible for in the Green Cut Fund. And this is because uh, they all have something in common. They basically intend to promote uh, access especially of least of countries and seeds to GCF climate finance. One of these is the simplified process which basically can finance uh, projects that require to GCF up to 10 millions and uh, uh, projects that uh, present a low level of environmental and social risk. So projects that uh, uh, for example, an incubator of new technologies, the one uh, that were presented, are normally a good fit for what we call SAP, simplified approval uh, process. What we've bet if uh, uh, these uh, SAP criteria are met is that this project can speed up uh, and be approved much faster than a regular funding proposal. This means also that these type of projects are really relevant, for example, in SEEDS, projects that promote disaster risk management actions and uh, not with uh, three years to be fined. So, so uh, even uh, an amount of 10 million in a country, in a small country like SEEDS, can actually have uh, a, a high impact. Uh, it can be highly transformational, especially if uh, it promotes changes at community level with uh, the local governments, with the community communities also with the micro and small businesses that are at the local level. Um, the other one is the enhancing the taxes. This is an envelope, a pilot program of $200 million uh, that uh, look especially on uh, building national local partnership so that uh, uh, national and local actors are the board uh, uh, the the decision making of how this finance that comes from the GCF through this pilot EDA is going to be spent, and it's quite interesting because focus that our board gave us when they promoted this pilot program EDA, it's really that we should target this type of finance that empower the local authorities on how uh, to use climate finance, and this can be with the private sector, with public sector. Uh, with money led climate change and disaster reduction action, but it's specifically targeting and prioritize the least developed countries and seeds. The last one is project preparation facility. This is a facility itself, uh, uh, which is capitalized that we manage directly as a secretary of the GCF. It's a facility of uh, capitalized with $40 million. We have already allocated more than half of it to help countries in preparing projects and especially national government that uh, with partnership with private sector or public sector institution or academia bring projects to the GCF, we can provide finance to prepare them. See you, Sarah. I think I finished. Because the last slide was just a, a very brief example of a project that we recently financed the SAP in the Philippines with the Land Bank, which is a, a, a bank in the Philippines and that uh, um, I don't go into the details, really focus on innovation uh, uh, system for reducing risks. And I stop here and I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions that the public can have. Over to you, sir. Great, thank you, Demetrio. So I think we, we've really uh, run through a variety of types of partnerships and now ending with some of the financing mechanisms uh, actually available through the Green Climate Fund and these three 
uh, three streams that uh, are particularly targeting the SIDS and LDC countries. So we have had a number of questions um, and we, we are, um, I, I think we, we could have used even more time to explore all of the rich presentations, but what I'll do is just um, group a couple of them and, and, and pose to each one of you. Um, so we see how we can get through uh, a few of these questions in the next minutes. So um, one of the questions uh, coming from Weller's Gasa Maraja is uh, for Mr. Assad. Uh, he asks, through crowdfunding, do you address your source of funding publicly or can you target some clusters? Is the funding obtained used anonymously for the general public or does it spill over back to the resources or sources of clusters specifically to encourage more involvement? What kind of strategies do you use for this uh, public sector involvement? Over to you, Mr. Azad. Thank you. Thank you, Valerius, for your very brilliant question and the in-depth uh, information you want to ask. Thank you very much. Uh, this is um, in Bangladesh, the first crowdfunding. So what we did uh, in this crowdfunding, uh, this was open, openly declared for all over the globe. And um, we used to put uh, some of the organization, those who will receive the crowdfunding. And then uh, when someone uh, intends to donate in crowdfunding, he or she can enter into the uh, devices and uh, can understand of where this money uh, is needed. Maybe they have two, three program. So the donor can identify where he or she wants to put uh, uh, money uh, and uh, at the same time not only putting the money at the end of expenditure um, these will be available in the web uh, that how this money has been spent so uh, this uh, crowdfunding open sourcing and uh, not targeting to any specific area but if the donor decides to spend his or her money in a specific area then if it was possible also. Uh, and we got a huge response from uh, inside the country and all over the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Azad. Uh, so next question um, posed for Ranit from Ranit Chatterjee. Um, so there was a question and follow up uh, to the assessment tool, for whom was it uh, prepared? And how do you build awareness of the community to fill it uh, or to use the tool? and how to make sure the government uses the database at the agenda setting process and policy preparation. Over to you, Rani. Yeah, that's a very important question, in fact. So when we design this data, we put the community at the center, but possibly the user uh, of this uh, collective data would be the local governments who are more at the implementation or more at the action, uh, you know, who are taking the action. But it can also be propagated through the subnational governments, as in India, we have subnational government who are uh, the ones who are responsible for disaster uh, management implementation, or through the national government who can make it more of a countrywide uh, specific, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of an approach on how to uh, assess the risk. So that's the thing. And it also would be useful to be shared with the NGOs or international NGOs who would be the um, kind of, who are supporting the government actions, say in awareness generation or through uh, different training programs. So it would be uh, actually cutting across both NGO sector as well as the government. Uh, the second question is, uh, on, uh, let me just go through the question again. Uh, I guess uh, the second point that has been asked is on. How to make sure the government uses the database in the agenda setting process? Yes. So yeah. I guess uh, as uh, I think we don't have to make sure, but possibly if such a data set is available, government would be readily willing to take it up. Only issue is how uh, kind of uh, what is the data source, how secure is the data source, and uh, what is the validity of the data. These possibly are the concerns that a government would have, but if it is readily available, and then 
we don't actually need this data set to come as you know very scientific very tough to understand uh, like information but very actionable bullet points that based on this 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 these are the three or four action that you need to take so if we can simplify it for the government i guess the governments would be more or less uh, willing to take it up thank you great thank you so I think there were a few more questions also about data privacy there, and I would welcome, uh, if possible, maybe you can answer a few in typing as well. So sure. um, Michelle, a um, couple of questions coming in, I'm gonna put together. One was asking, uh, how can we ensure that Africa is not left behind to achieve the Africa Agenda 2063? And another question specifically on uh, the use of um, MIS, ICT, and IoT utilization. It's a must to ensure that the technology use uh, leaves no one behind, especially rural and vulnerable communities, but how? Yes, fantastic. Really brilliant questions. Thank you for them. Uh, Agenda 2063 is so, so important, I think, in terms of Africa's transformation as a whole. Uh, and how can we ensure that Africa is not left behind? I think, you know, we really do first and foremost need to look at the underlying structures as well. So, you know, opportunities to for connectivity, I think it's a big challenge when you're talking about infrastructure systems uh, on the continent is still a very massive challenge. In order for us to actually bring in some of these solutions that I talked about, we do need to have a very strong infrastructure system or infrastructure base, but that's not, you know, uh, to say that we cannot implement some of these solutions. In fact, the continent has been leading in some of the solutions, actually, when you look at Kenya, you look at Rwanda, you look at Ghana, where they are utilizing blockchain for things like title deeds for land. Uh, you know, they're looking at uh, blockchain platforms in terms of utilizing digital currency as in, you know, digital money. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, cryptocurrency, again, is something that a lot of countries in Nigeria is starting to explore quite a lot. So there is quite a lot of activity already. But I think what we really need, I think, is for governments uh, to really start to think about, OK, how do we start to regulate this sector in, in such a way that we're not stifling innovation? Uh, you know, how do we start to understand the uh, opportunities that these innovators are bringing in? So you have in countries like South Africa uh, and others where they're introducing sandboxes where, again, you can bring in the fintechs and they're starting to, to explore and they're working with governments. Uh, and I know the Reserve Bank, for example, in South Africa is also quite involved in, in exploring things like central bank digital currency, again, as I mentioned. So there's massive opportunity, I think, to try and play around. And COVID has actually, you know, really ignited that, I think, in Africa, where you've utilized things like drones, as I said earlier, or earlier on. But we, we need to close the digital divide. So not everybody has access to the internet for, for number one. You know, not every child has access to those education opportunities I was talking about. And we need to really invest quite widely uh, in the basics to start with and then really start to utilize the tools that we do have to ensure that we're reaching a lot more people. So, you know, the many people that are in banks, I mean, Africa, 90% of the MISMIs, uh, medium, small enterprises, you know, what structures, initiatives are being developed to support them? Again, I call on digital financing, for example, that can help to reach more of those MISMI. Uh, you know, a lot of SMEs don't have that kind of credit uh, uh, worthiness that, you know, a lot of investors, you know, look at. Uh, to provide funding, for example, you know, how can we utilize uh, blockchain and technology like blockchain and, and AI to actually enable better, you know, financing structures for, for the MISMIs, which is critical for Africa. Then I, again, my point around demographics. So again, Africa's demographics very, very leans towards the young, uh, you know, sort of lots of women entrepreneurs and women business owners, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis who are running their businesses, but are very much crippled by the lack of access to capital, by the lack of access, you know, to um, uh, even sort of uh, mentoring and business support that can help them to scale what they're doing. So I think even we go back to the basics and, and start to understand actually the structures that we're working within and, that, and for Africa, for Africa, I actually think the digital revolution is, is one big answer uh, to really transform Africa and move Africa forward. Sorry, there was a second question, I think, Sarah, if you remind me. There was um, a, a question in general around MIS, ICT and IoT utilization and right. how to ensure that it does not leave others behind. So you've just touched a little bit on the digital divide. Sure. And especially I think I, the rural and other vulnerable communities. Sure, I think again, you know, back to my point around when we're designing some of these systems, the beauty with technology as well, you can design them in such a way, for example, in PESA, you know, which has SMA, 
uses SMS, uh, you know, for, for, for the money engagement. Uh, that's a clear example where, again, even people who might not necessarily have access to connectivity, I think, can utilize technology. So I think that's the beauty of really understanding and then leveraging things like IoT, where IoT is basically, you know, sort of the, providing connectivity across different de devices and sensors uh, around the world. Can it really enable that connectivity and opportunity to leverage off that? Uh, and I think how we can actually start to ensure we're closing the digital divide, I do emphasize very strongly around education again, um, you know, and providing those uh, infrastructures. Uh, education is pretty critical. Uh, and the young people that we do have in the continent, I think in Africa, if we can equip them, you know, with the skills, uh, upskilling is very important because of course automation is coming in, in to full force, but how can we upskill young people early enough? And, and, and a lot of young people I've met already actually uh, educating themselves. Uh, using their mobiles already, you know, and they're really excited about the solutions, they're developing their apps and they're coming up with these solutions, but a lot of them cannot scale uh, what they have because they're either limited to finance or they don't have access to, uh, you know, additional information. I think that's a role that we can really play working in partnership uh, with governments and range of other players. Wonderful, thank you. So this comes back also to creating the, the enabling environment to ensuring capacities and certainly looking uh, at ways that we can, can better enable these innovative partnerships. Um, thank you, Michelle. So I have one last question I'm going to direct uh, to Demetrio and uh, we have a participant, Venance, who has asked, is there any reason why Green, Green Climate Fund does not partner with the local governments and municipalities? So maybe you could explain this part. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, for that question. And uh, <clears throat> well, it, it depends on how you look at partnership. I believe the GCF indeed does also uh, partner with the local governments, uh, um, but maybe it's worth it to go back on how we partner. And how we partner is that uh, is through intermediaries we call accredited entities, uh, because basically the GCF is a donor, it provides uh, finance, it provides money to take uh, projects uh, at, the, at the community level, at the loan level. And so uh, when projects come to us and intend to do a disaster risk management investment at the local level. Of course, we ask that the relevant local authorities are involved in case one see them. Uh, the point is that uh, we, we, are the, we are a fund of funds. So uh, the local governments uh, receive uh, support uh, through the GCF by through projects that are in fact uh, brought to the GCF uh, through these uh, accredited entities. And uh, so that's why maybe at the level of interaction on uh, the specific action, there might be a feeling there is distance because in fact, uh, the entry point for the specific investments are the accredited entities. And of course, uh, our architecture, we are a multilateral fund. So uh, institutionally, our entry point, it's always the national government, the so-called national designated authorities, each country has a different one, sometimes the Ministry of Finance, sometimes the Ministry of Environment, sometimes someone else, uh, but being a, a multilateral institutions, we have also a framework, an institutional framework we have to follow uh, to operate with. Over. Thank you. So I really want to uh, give uh, a warm thanks to all of our uh, participating panelists. Uh, thank them for their time and joining us uh, from London, Michelle, all the way to Japan, Ranit, and uh, close this part of today's session. I think we have understood that partnerships, uh, I would say, are not just PIP, but maybe um, extra PIP, political will, innovation, investment, partnership and people. So these were some of the main takeaways I got from uh, the, the key messages. And uh, if we have not answered to some of the questions, we'll seek to try and get further answers uh, from our panelists to share with you. And so this concludes our panel for the day. And I thank you all again for, for joining us and for engaging. We're going to continue the session six um, to try and get your feedback. So let's just hear um, a final uh, round of thank you and goodbye from the panelists. Uh, Mr. Azad, thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Ra yes, Ranit, thank you. Michelle. 
Thank you. Thanks very and, much. Yeah, and Demetrio, thank you. Thanks. And then Good I'll be, Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So I'll be passing over now to my colleague, Mr. Kepin Yao from the UN Project Office on Governance, and we're looking forward to hearing from our participants. The panelists are welcome to stay, and you are also welcome uh, to go at the conclusion of this part. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, good, uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you have so far enjoyed the um, uh, online training workshop. And uh, um, also, um, I hope you could have the opportunity to check the toolkit on the risk informed governance and uh, innovative technologies for DRR and resilience. Yeah. So, um, before we um, check with you about your feedback about the uh, training and also the toolkit itself. I would like to first uh, let you know that uh, uh, our two offices, uh, uh, because we are co-organized for this online training, we were issued a certificates for those kind of participants who uh, attended our online training uh, f at least four sessions out of our six sessions. Yeah, so we will have to um, deliver the um, certificate to those kind of participants who successfully attended our uh, um, uh, online training workshop for, uh, for at least four sessions out of six sessions. Yeah, you could be uh, expect to receive the certificate by the end of this month. Yeah. Okay. So now I'd like to invite uh, um, uh, our two participants uh, to give their feedback. First, I would like to invite Mr. Edgar Alain Ais, uh, the second, who is a local DRIM uh, officer uh, from a Makiti um, DRIM office. Yeah. So, uh, Edgar, may I invite you to say a few words about your feedback, about uh, what do you feel from the participation in this uh, online training? Yeah, Edgar. Hello, uh, Edgar, are you here? Um, hello. Yes, 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 go ahead, yeah. Hello, um, I, oh, sorry. Um, it okay, shifted good. to a participant mode. Okay, good. Um, good afternoon. Um, I was tasked to, um, to give feedback on, on the module by UN, UN, DRR. Um, first, on organizing or designing, uh, on organizing or designing of the program. Um, with regards first to the registration, um, I think it would be um, um, it would be beneficial and would save some time if the registration would be a one time uh, one time registration rather than the participants being required to be to register every each session. Um, with regards to the program design, for the topics, I think that um, the topics are just right and progresses systematically because they involve the components of the risk governance, the people, mechanisms, and processes. Um, the topics are um, carefully selected at, as it focused on um, technology and the RR, which is um, um, most of the cities now are gearing towards smart cities, uh, towards um, addressing the challenges of our of resilience. And um, there is also a focus on public health emergency, which is um, timely. And the mode for free exchange of ideas uh, gives no pressure to for the participants to deliver input or feedback. And with regards to the platform, um, I think the platform has very much improved compared to the first time I encountered it in 2017. Um, it is more friendly and uh, it is very much welcome that the, that the organizers gave a step-by-step -step, um, step -step procedure on how to use the platform. Uh, with regards to 
the diversity of participants, I felt that uh, more sectors or more government offices should have been invited. And for the relevance and applicability of knowledge and experience sharing, it is very much uh, relevant and applicable to each and every one of us, especially the local government, which because the local governments are in the in the prime position to prevent the creation of risk and contribute to achieving national resilience. As what the 2030 local agenda have said, no one solution fits all. Uh, and that no one should be left behind. So we should uh, maintain an innovate, innovative mind and inquisitive minds to tap into the vast source of knowledge available to each and every one of us to address uh, our pursuit of resilience. In Makati, um, we have continually been uh, using the UNDRR's uh, resilience scorecard to to make us realize that there that we need to be updated and be abreast with DRR resilience and practices in order to address um, challenges in resilience and for the better delivery of public services. And lastly, uh, for way forward, uh, we look we look uh, we expect that the UNDRR have more per have organize more participation or exchange sessions with regards to risk governance, um, especially the innovation and the RR technology and uh, more, um, they may be more active participation from other sectors of the society, especially the private sector. And um, I think uh, UNDR have been, they have been they have tried this already in the another in the module in the evening in the paho module i think uh, this module if the, if this will be reiterated in in some other time it should be made also available in other languages like much like with the what you do in the disaster resilience scorecard available in different languages so as um, the language barrier may be uh, addressed so um, that I think that will be all. Thank you. Thank you, Etika. Uh, did you uh, just to check with you? Have you had any opportunity to check the toolkit itself, the training toolkit itself? Yeah. Guess we posted this tra training toolkit on the workspace. Did you have a chance to look at the training toolkit itself? Ah, uh, the, the toolkit. Um, actually, the toolkit. Um, actually, uh, it's reflective of the six sessions. Um, it. It offers a brief and concise um, summary of what should the participants know without um, basically creating more burden for them to understand the concepts of DRR and uh, innovations in DRR. Okay, so I, I really hope that you could have a more, little bit more time to review the toolkit and provide us some uh, kind of a concrete feedback or input uh, or your, your suggestions so that we can further improve the talk itself, yeah. That would be much appreciated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Erika, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. So now let me uh, uh, have the uh, pleasure to invite uh, uh, Mr. Henry uh, Williams, who is the uh, executive director from uh, National Disaster Management Agency. Yeah, Henry, um, can I invite you to speak? Yeah. Mr. Henry Williams. Yes, good morning. Good, good morning, yeah, Henry, yeah. It's good morning, yeah. Anyway, I'm gratified to be on this um, program. I started the program and I'm ending it. And I think it's very innovative, especially we are talking about um, technologies. Um, I just want to, let's say, highlight um, certain um, issues that I think we need to really holistically look at because even though we are talking about technology and we are talking about innovations but for them to be possible one we need um, the, the the political will and also we need um, serious awareness to be done because even if these um, instruments or innovative innovations are there we, they need to be simplified so that um, they can be available 
and they should be affordable and they should be easy to use. So, um, and in do it, we need capacity building. And in a whole uh, 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 adequate coordination mechanism should really be put in place. And that mechanism should be holistic. For instance, for us here in Liberia, the NDM is the coordinating body, but we have clusters and we have a lot of gaps. And this platform that we are using, we can get support from partners. Because if you look at the capacity of each of the institutions, they are very low. So we share, um, and that is the real bottom line, we share resources. Because um, where you are less, somebody will have something to, to, to give in return. So for instance, we have about seven, um, let's say clusters, including coordination, health, logistics, food and nutrition, shelter. We even use the private sector and we use religious groups. Um, and the, 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 the communities are very important. And we, we, we look at certain issues like gender and youth, and we include them um, because um, gender plays a very key role. And um, one institution that we should not overlook is the financial institution. They are let's say like the Ministry of Finance. They should always be part of this process. And as we look at COVID, we look at implementation. Here we also consider the security aspect very serious because even getting into the communities, you have to have security for anything to happen, even humanitarian distri distributions, et cetera. The security is very important. For all of the, um, um, the, 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 the messages, they were in place. And what we need to, let's say, work sub-regionally, we need to work regionally, like the DRR is helping. And also, we are also getting help, let's say, like from um, ECOWAS, the EU, etc. So this international um, partners, link partners. Then the, 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 the UN is also playing a greater part in Liberia, the one UN. Okay, they are also helping. But in all, we need coordination, we need resource mobilization and resource transfer. And we need a strong partnership and coordinating mechanism. And one thing we should plan not only for a single, let's say, disaster, but we should always be planning for multiple disasters. And now to plan for multiple disasters, this is where the linkage between, our, our, let's say, issues, countries, even nationally, which your system should not only be on the, let's say, the presidential area, but it should trick it down to go down to the, the counties and to go to other sectors so that it can be nationally felt. So I want to say thank you. Um, I enjoyed and I learned a whole lot. And uh, we okay. hope that such, uh, such Harry, sections yeah. will be, yeah. yeah. Can you uh, specifically um, um, give us some feedback uh, uh, about what do you feel about, for example, the design in the program designing, the selection of the of the thematic thematic topics, the topics of the themes. I mean, uh, do you think uh, how we can better improve? You know, and also just like Erica says that also he mentioned something about a logistic improvement for us, like a uh, registration. Do you have any like uh, suggestion recommendations for us? Uh, in this kind of aspects, and also what do you expect us if we want to have some follow up, some uh, uh, um, uh, training uh, um, activities after this kind of on six week uh, online training? Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I want to suggest is maybe you can broaden the participation. Um, uh, that is one, uh, because we're talking about the RR. It should be holistic. I mean, we should have greater participation. 
So maybe not only those that are directly concerned, but others can also be invited to take part. Um, the, the lectures were good, they were cohesive, they were very, very in place. And I hope that maybe in the future, um, apart from DRR experts, maybe other experts from the private sector can, their participation can be intensified. And even you can, uh, um, science-based students. They took you form part of this process. Okay. Also, Henry, I mean, for the toolkit itself, because uh, it's uh, this kind of online training workshop, it's also kind of a pilot testing of the toolkit, uh, which uh, um, was developed, uh, jointly developed by the UN Project Office and Governance and also the UNDR uh, Global Education and Training Institute. Uh, do you have, did you have a, a, any good opportunity to check the tool itself and how do you find it useful uh, to uh, applicable to your, uh, to, to your, to your real um, operations in your office? Yeah. I checked the toolkit and it is, um, it was, even though it was not comprehensively um, read, but I checked it and uh, I think it is okay. There are some, but I will give a feedback when I'm, let's say, really done with it. But I think the, the toolkit is in place and it's a very serious educational and uh, uh, directive. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we also look forward to receive your uh, concrete Hello? comment and the feedback. Yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. We can hear you, Henry. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Henry. I, I, I still um, The feedback will be sent. Um, the feedback will be sent. And in fact, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm still with you. Okay, okay. But, okay. but I'm getting um connectivity problem. I. In of the day for about ten minutes, I had to to rec Okay, I think uh, we lost uh, Harry. I think yeah. So anyway, um, thank you, Edgar. Thank you, Harry. So now I would like to like, uh, give another two or three minutes. So you might want to participants from the floor if you would like to give us any kind of feedback about this training itself. Yeah, so I would like to open the floor like for one, one more question, yeah. Anyone can volunteer to speak if you would like to Talk, please. Uh, okay, I have the two raised hands. Um, okay. So, Maria, you go ahead. Yeah. We have two raising hands. I don't know how to. And this too. Okay. Uh, Ugyo, Oguchi, Oguchi is. Oh, hello there. Can yeah, 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 go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for an excellent course. I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, my only recommendation is if you could, um, if there could be much more emphasis on um, Africa and the Caribbean. Um, I believe those, both those regions um, 
need to be very much at the forefront as regards disaster risk management and preparedness. Um, otherwise, it was an excellent um, course. Um, I enjoyed it immensely. I enjoyed waking up very early in New York to come online to attend this course. Um, um, absolutely well done. It was a very good course. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ugechi. Uh, now I'd like to invite, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Mr. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Just, Wood, right? Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Wood. Wood. Yeah. Mr. Wood. Mr. Wood, I, I, I want to I uh, thank the organizers of the program and equally the presenters. It was a wonderful program. I really benefited as a lecturer and also as a community worker. I really learned a lot on uh, resistance. Uh, uh, the uh, disaster resistant and uh, the tools, the technological tools that should be applicable to it. And uh, my plea is that the participants should uh, be further engaged. And we've talked about really uh, working on at the community level. I think the participants can be used to really work. Sorry, we cannot hear you now. Yeah. Community level, which they should be trained, or which should be trained. Them. Yeah, we better hear you, Mr. Oh. Yeah. Well, oh, these are things that we really need. Yeah, unfortunately, we cannot hear you. So um, as an alternative, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Opot, uh, I would, we would like to welcome you to send us your feedback through the email. So you can email us so that we can better know that uh, your, uh, your feedback, yeah. So uh, due to time uh, uh, constraint, now I'd like to close this kind of, op uh, this kind of uh, feedback session. So uh, Linda, we will do the po pose now, right? Po we do a poll here now, right? Poll or quiz, yeah. So, so we will we... be launching, we won't have a poll or quiz, but rather be launching the survey. And I'm just okay. posting that in the chat box. We'd ask for your feedback uh, by survey and also just to inform that the discussion will stay open uh, throughout this week, so you can also continue to exchange there. Okay, okay. So now that I uh, uh, um, over to you, Miss Sarah, you take it over from here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have we have exceeded uh, our time a bit, but we wanted to have a brief word uh, of closing from Mr. Sanjaya Bhatia our head of the UNDRR Global Education and Training Institute and office here in Northeast Asia, and then pass over to uh, Mr. Bo Kyung Chin, who is the head of the UN Project Office on Governance. So those of you that can stay with us, uh, please do. Sanjaya? Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to all the speakers today, the participants, uh, and also uh, I'm uh, very appreciative of the participants who have attended all the sessions or most of them and will be uh, receiving the certificate. But more important is that you were exposed to some very practical applications of technology, uh, which can help to reduce the disaster risks. And uh, we, uh, we hope that you can uh, be in a position to uh, apply uh, some of these uh, ideas. Uh, also, you are free to adapt them if you don't want to adopt them directly, but you can adapt. Uh, and we would also look forward to your feedback to us on how you used what you saw here, uh, not only in the, these sessions, but also in the toolkit, which has been supplied separately uh, and which has a lot of uh, very good examples of applications. So we'd be very happy to know uh, in the future uh, if you could let us know how uh, this course uh, and the toolkit has helped you to 
improve uh, or uh, make life better in your um, circumstances uh, in the in the place where you work uh, by applying some of these technologies uh, and by reducing disaster risk in this manner so please be in touch with us please do let us know how you apply it we will uh, of course <clears throat> uh, be uh, always ready to provide this course again uh, hopefully in the near future uh, it would be a face to face course not only online and uh, um, and uh, also uh, uh, we look forward to perhaps meeting some of you some of the of you the participants uh, again uh, hopefully in the near future maybe next year sometime when we can do this again uh, so with that i'd like to end my words i know it is over time but again i'd like to emphasize that please do try to adapt or adopt some of these technologies and see how they can work in your uh, scenario and and do let us know uh, of any success stories but also of any lessons that you have learned in this process thank you and goodbye thank uh, you mr bogyung chin yeah thank you uh, sara uh dear uh, speakers and uh, participants i'd like to congratulate great to you all for your successful participation and the completion of this online training workshop on risk informed governance and innovative technologies for disaster risk reduction and building resilience over the last six weeks i hope all of you have enjoyed your participation enhanced your knowledge and learned many good innovative approaches and practices for disaster risk reduction and building resilience as the co-organizer of this online training workshop, it was my great pleasure to see very active participation and the interactions of participants during the sessions and through the workspace. I deeply appreciate your active engagement and great enthusiasm. I hope this online training has provided a valuable opportunity to share knowledge and exchange innovative practices between governments as well as among academia, private sector, civil society organizations. This online training workshop is the piloting of the training toolkit on risk informed governance and the innovative technologies on DRR and resilience. I hope you could find some time to review the toolkit and provide your valuable comments for us to further improve the toolkit in this regard. I would suggest the way forward of the toolkit for your further collaboration. Next slide, please. Uh, the main purpose of the toolkit is to provide the ready to use training material to support member states' efforts to strengthen country level capacities to promote risk informed governance for DRR and resilience. In terms of structure, the toolkit consists of three modules with 11 sub modules designed for a five day training program and can be used as direct uh, training and training of trainers. The toolkit uh, is a comprehensive and fully customizable training material with a manual, facilities guide and PPTs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, please be advised that this toolkit is part of the overall UNDESA curriculum on governance for SDGs, which consists of nine interrelated uh, toolkits. The uniqueness of this particular toolkit on DRR and resilience is that it adopts a balanced approach in strengthening risk-informed governance and leveraging innovative technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, to help to improve the toolkits, we are inviting uh, external uh, reviewers in the field of public governance and the GRR to review and uh, provide expert opinion on the toolkit. Sim similarly, we solicit your kind uh, support to also review and send us your feedback and comments, especially from users perspective to ensure that it could be tailored to your specific needs. We can also organize the tailored training based on your demands. For example, a training with a special focus on data and digital government for DRR and resilience. 
Next slide, please. We are currently preparing an additional module on public health emergencies to address issues on COVID-19. This is part of our continued commitment to capacity development in member states to address public health emergencies. We will further strengthen our collaboration with the UNDRR as well as other UN agencies like WHO, ITU, SCAP in supporting member states' capacity development. Next, please. We look forward to receiving your comments on the toolkit. Please submit your response through the link provided on the slide, which will also be reshared with you through the workspace. I'm now done with my slides. Linda, you can uh, kindly close the slides. Next, based on our discussions during the past six weeks, I would like to highlight a few key takeaways with policy implications for DRR and building resilience. First, strengthening risk-informed governance is critical for in effective and sustainable DRR and resilience building. An effective risk-informed governance includes such major components of as leadership, institutional coordination, empowering local authorities, effective risk communication strategy for ensuring public trust, integrated decision-making through real-time data, information sharing, and stakeholder engagement and partnership are particularly imperative. Second, fostering the inclusion of vulnerable groups in DR policy design and implementation is important for ensuring leaving no one behind. Innovating governance, addressing the digital divide, and empowering vulnerable groups are, as agents of change are particularly significant for inclusive DRR strategies. Through the leveraging frontier technologies and harnessing digital government greatly contribute to risk-informed decision-making and the effective response to disasters. Moreover, robust and uh, accurate disaggregated data are essential for risk-informed decision-making and open data and big data analytics so enable governments to effectively anticipate, prepare, and respond to risks and disasters. This also requires strengthening data governance for effective data sharing and management, especially the protection of data privacy and the data security. Fourth, strengthening public governance and leveraging technologies and digital government can contribute to better responding to public health emergencies, including the current COVID-19 pandemic. Engagement of all actors, uh, both all at, all at the national and local levels, is especially imperative for timely, efficient, and inclusive response to public health emergencies. Last but not least, the importance of fostering innovation and building partnerships with the private sector and other stakeholders was emphasized today. Government needs to actively engage with the scientists, researchers, entrepreneurs and startups, as well as the youth and the students to foster innovative collaboration for GRR and building resilience. We hope that you can further share the new ideas and knowledge gained through our online training course with your colleagues and friends in your country, so that more countries, cities, communities can better address disasters whose impacts are becoming complex and systemic. UNDESA DPIDG UNPO, in partnership with the UNDRL and other partners, will continue making our best endeavors to support member states in DRL and building resilience, particularly for sustainable and resilient recovery from COVID-19. We look forward to continued co collaboration with you. Lastly, I would like to close my remarks by extending my sincere appreciation to the co-organizers of this online training workshop, UNDRL GETI, the Ministry of the Interior and Safety, and the Incheon Metropolitan City of the Republic of Korea. Thank you very much, and I wish you all stay safe and healthy. Uh, now I'd like to invite all participants to turn on your videos for a round of online photos. Please turn on your videos. Thank, thank you, Bo Kyung. So unfortunately, uh, due to the webinar uh, use today, we will not be able to allow the videos. So what we would like to invite is we will be, when we are sending to the participants uh, your certificates of participation, we would kindly ask you to take your own photograph 
with the certificate and share that photo back with us and we would like to make a, a course collage so that we do have all of the participants. Um, those of you in the panelist room, you are free to also turn on your, your cameras now if, if uh, you'd like a last photograph with the panel group. And to all of our participants, we thank you again. Uh, this has been very enriching for us as well. We have learned a lot from all that you have shared. And uh, we will continue the discussion during this week online. We will be sharing the certificates and look forward to your feedback uh, in particular on the toolkit as well. So thank you very much. And uh, I think this can conclude our course. We thank you. Thank you all very much.